I want to um, read this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 14. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? May the Lord set his face upon us today as we worship him and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, the path is long. The path is through treacherous, stormy seas. But the path is your path, chartered and authored by the Son Jesus and with us is your Holy Spirit. Be with us today as we on this journey began anew this idea of what it means to be in mission with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I do want to remind you that... Um, we need to pray for our friends at Heritage House. Uh, apparently they've had an outbreak of COVID. So we will not be having our nursing home service there today. Keep them in our prayers, both the workers, the residents. And uh, let's go to the Lord and worship him. Sandy? Celebrations. Aren't they great? Gary is celebrating a birthday today. Adele and I celebrated our anniversary yesterday. Can't believe she'd have me for 45 years. No, I 45 years. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, that sounds better. <laughs> Milestones, aren't they? Remind us we've come through some stuff. Hopefully we've learned a few things along the road. Gathering together with family is important, but so is it to gather together on the Lord's Day. What I know is we have a lot going on in the world. In the midst of our celebrations, there's a lot of brokenness, grief, disappointment, division, suffering, poverty, ignorance. The very stuff that God with his big megaphone called the church. Called the church. And so we are sent from the nice celebrations to the nasty where people are. Sometimes churches, Bill Gates, bars in the inner city try to hide. The church should never be a fortress. It should never be a place to hide. 
and needs to be a trampoline. So, let's go to the Lord today. Praying for our world. Praying for the call of God to show us where and how and when and what to do. Let's go to the Lord right now. One by one, you call us by name. You call us to yourself. You call us to salvation. You call us to serve in your army. You call us to go forth into a world that is broken. It's broken by loss. It's broken by disappointment. It's broken by division. It's broken by ignorance. It's broken by terrorists. It's broken by seduction. It's broken by suffering and hatred, crime in our streets, evil in high places and low places. And Lord, it is into that that you call us. For that's where people are. That's where you are. In the muck and the mire and the the nastiness of the world, that's where you are. That's where you were on the cross. Dying for the sins of humankind to bring new life. The offering by your Holy Spirit that you would send Lord, today, the megaphone calls. Help us to be bold. Help us to be guided. Help us to stand. Help us to tell the truth even when it seems like we are talking to a brick wall. Because you shatter and you melt and mold and reshape even the hardest cases for your glory. We pray these in your name. Amen. And before pastor's message, just a closer walk with thee.
turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter, or I mean to Acts chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading at verse 54, but we are also going to be uh, looking at uh, some of those verses later on. And then I'm going to be reading through chapter 8, verse 1. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears, and they rushed upon him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside the robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from God's word. You do not have a PowerPoint today. Uh, I'm not sure what happened, but I was working with a number of thumb drives and saving things and moving things around, and I'm not sure where it is, but it's not here. But anyway, today is a rollout of God's mission. Now remember, we started this year with the understanding we were going to try to challenge each other to read through the Bible. And we really, we are in Psalms and Romans. We're just getting ready to finish up the book of Romans. So that means we're in this section of material that was lettered by Paul the Apostle. Of the New Testament books, he literally wrote half of the books in our New Testament. And if you look at a chapter count of all those books, he wrote one-third. He literally re-energized and focus the church on the footsteps of Jesus, which is the title for this series of messages, Footsteps of Jesus. It encounters the missionary journey of Paul the Apostle. Now, I want us to begin today by understanding that God calls individuals. I knew a young lady some years ago, her name was Brittany. Brittany was born with a, a defect. She could hardly see. In fact, the doctors told her that she would be blind by the time she was middle-aged to, to 40. Um, she had problems walking though she joined the cross-country team. (laughs) Mom ran with her, attended every practice so she knew how to navigate the courses. But as a sophomore in high school, her parents sent her to the school for the deaf and blind in Indianapolis. 
so that she could learn skills for the day when she could no longer see for herself. She graduated, and then she went to Grace College. And four years in Grace College, she learned about all kinds of things Christian. She also, during her four years, took a missionary trip to our third world country where she saw kids like her physically challenged in one way or another. And either because there was not the doctors present or the resources of parents to take children to doctors, they just threw them out. Threw them out to die. And Brittany felt a call. So she finished her college while she was there, she met a man in the elementary education, which is what she was studying, specifically uh, special ed. He was studying to be an elementary teacher. They fell in love, got married upon graduation, and then they decided to be missionaries. They joined Wycliffe Bible Translators, which is a very strict process because you have to earn your own support. You have to go around to lots of churches and tell them what you're going to do. You've got to raise enough support for two years. And since they were married, double. You had to be in touch with all of your churches and uh, supporters and you had to have supporters back home too, praying for you and covering for you and helping you and encouraging you, kind of people who had been there and done that. So she and her husband were sent to the Philippines for two years. My point is, Brittany had something else in mind. And God called her. The reality is, the book of Romans, that verse that we read at the start of the hour, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they hear upon him in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? Somebody has to go. And God today has got his megaphone out and he's calling people by name. Most of us think of missionaries as being people who are clear across the ocean in a third world country, and they might be. But mission can be wherever we are. It can be in RAC. It can be at Westport Camp as a summer volunteer or even in the fall as they began to clean up the camp or having retreats. It can be a musician that writes or performs for the Lord. It can be literally helping out in the food pantry. A discerning ear upon the people that come for food that are talking about a hunger that goes much deeper. God is calling his people to mission. He's got the megaphone out. And the demor this morning, what we've got to realize is, as this rollout, God calls us Maybe in a moment where we're in a crisis of faith, where what we have believed formerly doesn't work anymore. So we're on a journey, a journey we're going to take for the next couple of months. And in this journey, we're going to learn the route that these missionaries took. 
We're going to talk about the resistance, the obstacles. Now, life is filled with obstacles. Because when you enter another person's territory, and that territory Satan thinks is his, you're going to have resistance of all kinds, external and internal. But in the middle, there's going to be a revelation of something special. The Holy Spirit wants to be seen to move forward. And there is a result. So, today, the route begins at ground zero, Jerusalem. Now, if you go back to the book of Romans, or Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we really have the outline for the entire book. Acts 1.8 says you are going to receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Ground zero. Judea. The southern part of Israel. The place where David built the temple or Solomon built the temple and David had the capital, the city of Jerusalem. That's ground zero. That's where God planted the church on the day of Pentecost with Jews that had traveled to Jerusalem from all over the dispersed world. Jews that were Hebrew speaking, but also other dialects that came there to partake of Pentecost. And Judea. And Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Ground zero. Now what we need to realize is that ground zero is first of all where Jesus for a time is going to leave his apostles. Andrew and Peter and James and John, the, the, the whole twelve apostles. Uh, Matthias that he is called to be a part of those original twelve when Judas Iscariot hung himself. Those twelve are going to stay in Jerusalem. But there's going to be this wide scattering of God's people all across the diaspora. The dispersed. But also in Jerusalem is this synagogue. Acts chapter 6 talks about this synagogue of the freedmen. made up of Jewish legalists from all over. Now, understand what has happened. They already allowed John the Baptist to be killed. That is a rejection of God's messenger. That's strike one. Strike two. They have crucified Jesus, the anointed Son of God, on a cross. That is a rejection of God, the Son. And as Stephen begins to argue, he talks about them resisting the Holy Spirit. And they take him out and stone him. That is a rejection of the Holy Spirit. Now, why that's important. You can get by with rejecting God for a while. You can get by even by denying Jesus as a Savior for a while. Or rejecting the Holy Spirit. Luke 13 reminds us all the other sins among men that are committed will be forgiven, but for blasphemy of the Spirit will not be forgiven. What is blasphemy of the Spirit? It's when you are under conviction. The Spirit has placed upon, it's, it's, it's pointing at you, and you say, that's not me. 
That's not me. I'm too good for this. That's not me. Okay. Well, that's the route. Ground zero. And in this story today, the interesting thing is the resistance has to do with these Jewish legalists. Remember, the call of God comes in a crisis of faith. Saul of Tarsus was not a nice guy. His defense in Acts 28 says he was born a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, educated under Gamaliel, one of the most respected rabbis, a Pharisee, a keeper of the law, and zealous to the point of persecuting Christians. He was not a nice guy. He had something else on his mind. And that day, as Stephen stands, it says these witnesses, this synagogue of freedmen, it says they gnash their teeth. You ever seen a big, mean guard dog? A junkyard dog. And you're looking around for a part or a piece for your car, and you get into the wrong area. And he comes out from where his house is. And he looks at you and you look at him and he, he shows you his fangs. And he drools. He's staring at you as if to say, one more move. And your dinner. Gnashing of teeth. Ugh. Isn't that way we go? Somebody cuts us off. Ugh, I hate it when they do that. They zip it in line before me in the grocery store. Ugh, I hate it when they do that. Gnashing of teeth. The barred teeth. The anger. And then it says they grab their ears and cover them up. He's told them something. They refuse to hear. They have blocked it out. No! We're denying this. We're refusing to even listen to this. We have closed our minds to this possibility. And it says they rush upon him. And they drag him out of the city. And they began to stone him to death. Now, according to the Mosaic law, stoning, those who were the witnesses were the first to cast the first stones. So those who were the closest were the first to start. These are big stones. Big enough to crush a head. Mortal wounds to the body, the rib cage, the vital organs. It was a brutal death, a suffering death, where bruises and broken bones preceded the actual death. And it says, these all laid their cloaks at the feet of a man named Saul of Tarsus. Why? Because it's Jerusalem. There's special Roman legions stationed in Jerusalem because they know the penalty of the people to rise up and to rally up and to cause problems and any disturbance. And there's all kinds of police and all kinds of spies. Any attention and there's going to be Roman guards all over the place to stop it. 
But when there's a witness, Saul of Tarsus, when he says who he is, <laughs> the Roman soldiers, they just go, these stupid Jews, why do they do all this stuff? We don't understand. And they go back home. Gather that in your mind. Jesus, uh, Paul has got, Saul has got these cloaks of the witnesses. He's holding them. He's agreeing with them. He's saying, bring it on. Now hold that pose. Because in this story, what we have is the revelation of Stephen. Remember Stephen is one of the deacons that was chosen to help remedy the fact that the Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And in a short time, he ends up debating this synagogue of the freedmen. And they have no problems with his history of Israel. Abraham and Moses and the prophets. But when he calls him stiff-necked, he's basically saying, you stubborn, hard-headed. And that's when they gnash their teeth. But he's not going to stop because he is a faithful follower of Jesus. Then when he talks about Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father, remember who they crucified? They will not hear of it. But he's not going to stop saying what he sees. I see Jesus at the right hand of God the Father. Now remember Saul is the witness. He is looking at this. And then, then Stephen begins to pray. Into my hands I commit my spirit. Isn't that what Jesus said on the cross? Receive my spirit? And then he prays also like Jesus. Don't let this sin given to their charge. Forgive them. He dies totally composed. Speaking the truth. Praying, receive my spirit in confidence and forgiveness. And that's the image that hard-hearted the rocker carries from that day. Now, and for a while, by the way, when you tell somebody in love what their sins are, they don't always hear you first. Sometimes for years. Sometimes for years they don't hear. Sometimes they get angry first. Sometimes they withdraw first. Sometimes they cut you off first. That doesn't silent the hound of heaven. You ever heard that poem? The hound of heaven. The hound of heaven, when he wants you, he chases you down the dark alleyways. All of your ways of trying to run from him 
I think there was in Saul of Tarsus this little thing, a call. And I think there was also a crisis of faith that all my works did not set me up for the composure that I saw as Stephen was dying, even though I was the witness. And I allowed it. I see, I see with the rest of them. Saul hasn't cracked yet. But there's a crisis going on here. I think about some of the hardest hearts The man who wrote Amazing Grace, a slave trader. Chuck Colson, the hatchet man of Richard M. Nixon that went to prison for the Watergate. Nicky Cruz, head of the Mau Mau's when David Wilkerson came to town with his campus crusade or his, his, his crusade to target and call the drugs and the groups that were fighting. Some of the hardest hearts until they crack and melt. Maybe, maybe there are some here, long time ago, the Lord called you to do something, and life got in the way. Maybe it was your fault, maybe you were rebelling, maybe you were running. Maybe you had family responsibilities or debts. Or you had parents that had your life on a different course, a different idea. Or maybe you were in the military and were bound by your promise to the nation for a while. I don't know, but I do know the conviction of God's Spirit, the megaphone, doesn't go away. It calls. Now, yes, in the end, we can still say no. But to our detriment and to our misery, but it keeps calling you and me by name. And so today, how will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How will they hear? Without you. Without me. Doing what we're called to do. The call is to go. Go. But we're on a journey, aren't we? Let's pray. Lord, You who saw us at our mother's womb. You who allowed (laughs) our unformed bodies to be arranged. Our DNA, our spiritual gifts, our personality, 
the experiences that we will have, the parents that we will have, the difficulties we will have. You orchestrated us. And the day we were born, you underlined your handiwork. No, we have not said no yet, or not said yes, maybe. Maybe it has made us angry. Maybe it has made us hard. Maybe it has, maybe we've distanced ourselves from the real stuff of faith. We've just Christian in name only. But you are a hound. And you keep at it until we choose yes or no. And when we say yes, there's an impact. And when we say no, there is misery. And judgment. So today, call, call, bring out your megaphone, amen. Let's sing our song of decision. stand singing together footsteps I travel the earth I travel the earth from the church to our homes our neighborhoods our shopping malls our place of work and where we celebrate with friends and family and in every avenue there are people who do not know who have not yet had the convicting of their spirit. 
The Bible reminds us that the Spirit, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. We embrace that. We embrace that. We embrace the work of your Spirit. Now lead us by that Spirit from this place. Amen.